Rape Culture The pre-Civil War South was a rape culture as far as female slaves were concerned. Virginia Slave Laws The first African slaves to be introduced to North America arrived at Jamestown, Virginia in 1619. Virginia would subsequently enact slave laws. The laws created what is called chattel slavery. In other words, slaves and their offspring were slaves for life and had no more rights than an ordinary farm animal. In 1662, Virginia enacted the enactment of hereditary slavery law which made any child who was born of a slave mother a slave for life. In 1705, the Virginia Slave Codes allowed slave owners to do as they pleased with their slaves, even if it resulted in the death of a slave, without any repercussions, slaves were property. A slave owner was free to rape a female slave because she was his property. If a white man were to impregnate a female slave, he did not have to support or even claim that child. If the mother of the child was his property, he gained not a child but additional property and another source of labor and income. Virginia's slave laws made it profitable for slave owners to rape their slaves because it resulted in more slaves. George v. State In George v. State, the Supreme Court of Mississippi ruled in 1859 that a black enslaved man could not be convicted of raping an enslaved woman because it was only a crime to commit a rape upon a white woman. A black male slave named George had raped a nine-year-old black female slave and had been sentenced to death. However, Mississippi Supreme Court ruled that rape committed by a male slave against a female slave was not considered a crime. The court held that under the common law and under Mississippi statutory law it was not a crime for a black man to rape a black woman or even a girl of nine. According to the court, masters and slaves cannot be governed by the same common system of laws, so different are their positions, rights and duties Hill and Jordan, 1995. The court concluded that a male slave could only commit a rape upon a white woman. The court reasoned that slaves were not protected by the common law or statutes because they were under the legal dominion of their masters as required by their status as property. Robert Lumpkin Robert Lumpkin was one of the South's most prolific and brutal slave traders, presiding over a slave jail in Richmond so notorious that it was referred to as the Devil's Half Acre. Lumpkin had five children with a slave named Mary. Mary was born in 1832, the possible biracial child of an enslaved woman and her owner. She was sold as a young girl and purchased by Robert Lumpkin, a man who was 27 years older than her and known for being violent. Lumpkin raped Mary. Mary had the first of their five children when she was only 13 years old. Thomas Jefferson In 1808, President Thomas Jefferson and Congress ended the importation of slaves from Africa. This made slave breeding farms in states like Virginia and Maryland more profitable. Ending the external supply of slaves drastically increased the price of domestically bred slaves. As a Virginia slave owner, the prohibition was also in Jefferson's best interest. Jefferson referred to his female slaves as capital. I consider a woman who brings a child every two years as more profitable than the best man of the farm," Jefferson remarked in 1820. What she produces is an addition to the capital, while his labors disappear in mere consumption. In 1792, in a letter to President George Washington, Jefferson said he was making a 4% profit every year on the birth of black children. In fact, Jefferson fathered as many as six children with a slave he owned named Sally Hemings. Jefferson was 44 years old while Hemings was only 14 when the sexual relationship started in 1787. Female slaves expected to become pregnant at 13. On breeding farms, female slaves were forced to have as many children as possible. Female slaves were valued based on their ability to produce children and were referred to as breeding stock and breeders. Childbearing started around the age of 13, and by 20 female slaves would be expected to have four or five children. Forced sex Slave women were subjected to rape, arranged marriages, forced matings, sexual violation by masters, their sons or overseers, and other forms of abuse. Systematic breeding of slaves often forced incest upon slave families. Slaves were given hoods or bags over their heads to keep them from knowing who they were having forced sex with.
It could be someone they know, perhaps a niece, aunt, sister, or their own mother. Franklin and Armfield In the 1830s, Franklin and Armfield, the largest domestic slave trading firm in the nation, was headquartered in Alexandria, Virginia. Written correspondence between the firm's three partners indicate that the partners engaged in the systematic rape and abuse of the female slaves in their custody. The partners sought young, light-skinned female slaves for their customers and their own personal sexual gratification. The partners wrote about raping the female slaves in their custody. Most of these female slaves in the firm's custody were children, as young as eight years old, and teenagers. Fancy girls became prostitutes and concubines. Slave traders called a young, light-skinned, female slave a fancy girl. The fancy girl trade was very lucrative. A slave trading firm like Franklin and Armfield could easily make a 100% profit by auctioning a fancy girl in New Orleans. Franklin and Armfield's goal was to supply fancy girls to its customers in the Deep South for the explicit purpose of prostitution and concubinage. The firm purchased young, light-skinned women for cash in Virginia and Maryland. Once in the firm's custody, these young female slaves were routinely raped by the firm's staff. Fancy girls were the most expensive category of female slave at slave auctions in New Orleans. Fancy girls sold for four to five times what a female field laborer would sell for at auction. Fancy girls on occasion could sell for as much or more than a prime male field laborer. At slave auctions, fancy girls were well-dressed and often wore jewelry. Banks funded sex trafficking operations. Franklin and Armfield, a slave trading firm that engaged in sex trafficking of minors received funding from major banks. The buying and selling of fancy girls was financed through the Second Bank of the United States, which was located in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The bank had 25 branches including a New Orleans branch. One drop of Negro blood. In New Orleans, any woman who was proven to have one drop of Negro blood could not marry a white man, and any of her children fathered by a white man would be illegitimate. His applied even if the woman appeared to be white. That meant that the purchaser of a mixed race, fancy girl could rape her at will and father children. Nonetheless, the new owner had no legal obligations to the fancy girl or any children he fathered with her. The new owner could sell the children he fathered with the fancy girl to a slave trader. The most a fancy girl could expect to become was her owner's mistress.